Dear friends, in a rather tragic development, Amnesty International, the world's premier human rights organization, a civil society and international civil society organization that strikes to protect and safeguard human rights everywhere, is shutting down its operations in India. Uh, this is a major blow against India's civil society and India's credibility and status as a democracy. Amnesty International says that Indian government's harassment, freezing of its account, interrogation of its employees have all contributed to an environment where it is not easy for it to work. They are afraid that perhaps some of their employees might even be jailed. And so this fear of harassment for their staff has compelled them to shut down operations in India. The Indian government claims that they are investigating Amnesty International for essentially violating India's laws of foreign currency. I mean, the money that is coming to finance Amnesty International from abroad is violating India's laws. But they also claim that, that the entire uh, Amnesty's work of trying to uh, monitor India's human rights is just uh, a, a digression. Uh, and apparently Amnesty's sole purpose is to bring money into India. Uh, it, it is unbelievable. I mean, the credibility of the Indian judiciary system is so low. Uh, and on top of that, they have such terrible imagination. Amnesty International has most recently produced reports about the bias that the Delhi police has shown uh, during the Delhi riots. They've also documented uh, Indian government's practice of torture in Kashmir. And some of these reports may have irked the Indian government and prompted them to shut down Amnesty International. Uh, this is also a counterproductive move, I think, by the Indian government. It further undermines India's credibility. So it is with this background that I speak with Govind Acharya, who has uh, been working for more than 20 years with Amnesty International in various capacities. He was a volunteer. Uh, he worked in Afghanistan to set up the operations of Amnesty International in Kabul. He served on the board of Amnesty International, and he's also one of the main persons who, who, for Amnesty International, keeps an eye on human rights in South Asia and India. So I will, uh, without much ado, turn to us, uh, Govind Acharya, and uh, get an update on what is going on in India with regards to the closure of Amnesty International. Uh, let's start by talking about how big uh, was uh, Amnesty International's operations in India, Govind? They had about um, 130 to uh, close to 140 staff people um, at the time of of the closing, and um, all of those people are are going to be laid off. So that that includes everyone from um, you know the executive dire director down on down. You know, one of the things I heard was that many of these employees are so dedicated to their mission that some of them have volunteered to work without pay for a while so that they can finish the reports that they were writing. Uh, the, the reports that are coming out, I saw the Washington Post, New York Times, and other reports, they are all saying that the reason for shutting down of Amnesty International's operations are harassment by the government of India. So if you could tell our viewers a little bit more about what kind of harassment do human rights organizations face these days in India? Yeah, I mean, the, the harassment has been uh, ongoing for, for a number, number of years. I think that the uh, best way to start is to start, um, and, and it has been, I, I just want to say that it, it's not only the current government, but we also had a number of problems uh, during the uh, UPA government. In fact, we had a previous iteration of Amnesty India had to close down um, in 2009. But the recent spate of uh, issues has arisen. It started to rise around um, in 2016. The first, first incident was uh, Amnesty India wanted to do a, uh, a, um, an event in Bangalore around um, human rights issues in Kashmir. And uh, there were, um, there was a legal charge brought to, uh, brought against Amnesty by, and there was harassment by the uh, ABVP, which is the um, student wing of the BJP in Karnataka, or not in India. And um, 
and there was a, a lot of um, issues around that, a lot of harassment around that. That took years to resolve. In 2018, late 2018 was the first time Amnesty India's bank accounts were frozen. Uh, that was in October 2018. Um, that was the culmination of a 10 hour, uh, 10 hours of uh, interrogations within the Amnesty India office in, in Bangalore. And it, um, uh, it was, um, caused the bank, uh, our bank accounts were frozen and um, the work was basically stopped at that time. There was a partial lifting of the freeze in one of those bank accounts in um, a few, few weeks later. And um, so we, Amnesty India was only able to use money that was after the freeze had occurred. Uh, so they were able to um, continue operations, but the number of staff had to be laid off at that time. The, um, the most recent occurrence happened on September 10th, when um, without, without any uh, notice that, that this was happening, the bank account, the remaining accounts were frozen by the enforcement director at the ED on, on September 10th. And uh, subsequent to that, um, after interrogations of a number of staff or board members in, of Amnesty India, decision was made, a very unfortunate decision was made that uh, un until the bank accounts are, are unfrozen or if that ever happens, um, we cannot continue um, operating in India. And so that was when the decision was made to close and that was the official last day was yesterday for the uh, for Amnesty India. It is really unfortunate because India has such a uh, vibrant tradition of um, civil society, and uh, we we wanted to play one small part of of civil society in India. But that that unfortunately has come to an end. Maybe in the future we can we can come back, but the prospects thus far are not um, are unknown. Uh, do you have any idea of how much of the funding that um, came to Amnesty International came from overseas and how much was it raised locally? Because talking to some people in India, one of the accusations that they're making are that these are foreign funded organizations uh, and if these were indigenous uh, and if they were raising funds locally, then that would not be a problem. So essentially, there's an implication that there is a foreign hand, you know, this conspiratorial attitude, that there is a foreign hand and there is a foreign cons conspiracy to make India look bad. So uh, were, were all the funds coming from overseas or were the local contributions too? No, so, so the, um, the operations of, uh, there's an entity called Indians for Amnesty International Trust and that's full, solely funded solely by money raised within India. And then, um, so they use a set of strategies to raise funds from local donors. And there's um, about, there were about 11,000 or so uh, individual supporters who give a small amount of mon money and that's a monthly. It's very common uh, in many countries, they incur, uh, I do that as well here in the United States where you get, um, you give say $10 a month to public radio and you do it on an ongoing basis from the credit card. And that was a similar thing that was done in, um, in Amnesty India. There's also the digital and online campaigns and it generates, um, so you get one-time donations and that's, um, uh, so you get that as well. And then there's um, major donors, but those are also um, Indian, uh, Indian based, uh, um, entities. So that's the, that's what's called Indians for Amnesty International Trust. And um, so that, that's the, um, that's the funding mechanism. There's also uh, what's called Amnesty International PL that receives payments, but that's for contractual services that are rendered to clients. And, um, but the, the, the transactions are all in full compliance of Indian laws. And so, um, and, uh, and the government has known, known these, uh, 
any of these transactions. So, so there's nothing, there's nothing particularly uh, um, secretive about them. I mean, these are all in, in public view. But so, so there's not only harassment by the government, but also there is this false narrative that is being spread out there saying that this is uh, uh, funded by foreign sources. What, what does this say about India that uh, Amnesty International, one of the world's uh, most important uh, human rights organization, I mean, not only does it act to protect human rights, but it has in the last few decades also educated the world at large about the significance of human rights uh, and, and also tried to encourage governments and civil societies to, to recognize and respect the, the importance of human rights. So what does it tell about India today that uh, an institution like Amnesty International is not welcome in India? Well, there has been uh, a distinct, uh, unfortunate uh, contraction in the, in, in the space in which um, civil society can, can operate and, and be critical of the government. There's, um, in addition, and one of, the, one of the challenges here is that a lot of attention has been drawn, of course, to Amnesty International India having to close its operations, but, but also occurring at the same time, and, and I think even also very problematic, even if not more, is, is the crackdown on dissent against um, against the Indian government, for example, the use of the uh, Unlawful Activities Prevention Act that has jailed a number of um, of dissenters and the like. And so it has it has constricted the space. So it's not just Amnesty International that has been affected, of course. Greenpeace India, which was in um, which was a quite a vibrant operation. I remember uh, a lot of their uh, tremendous work that they have done, they had done over the years, they actually had to close operations at the same time in late 2018 when Amnesty India was targeted, Greenpeace was also targeted and they actually had to shutter operations. They were not able to continue. And a number of other organizations that, that are definitely much more known within India have also had, had challenges in terms of their um, ability to operate um, and it has, it has, it has been constricting slowly. The uh, there were recent amendments to the FCRA, which is the Foreign Contribut Contributions Registration Act, which which has has shrunk, and I think the intention is to shrink the space even further on um, operations of NGOs, and and these are NGOs that uh, people outside of. India may not have heard of, and and those to me are even more concerning because they don't have they don't have the heft of Amnesty International that can call on the international media and things like that. And so so while it's important, while I, we want to of course highlight the closure of Amnesty India, it's very important for us to acknowledge that there's these other other people who are. Uh, being targeted solely for um, wanting to participate within civil society, and and to me, uh, that that's a very troubling troubling development. We should be encouraging. We should be encouraging uh, dissent, even if it's uncomfortable, especially if it's uncomfortable for the government. But even if it is uncomfortable for the government, they should allow that space, and it, it, it the outcome of that will be an. Uh, a much better India for everyone. Yes, I mean, without a strong civil society, you cannot have government accountability and therefore right. the vibrancies of democracies will collapse. Uh, lately, the Indian judiciary, which was quite well known and respected uh, for its independence. Uh, in fact, uh, on occasions, I've even heard uh, Pakistani scholars of law uh, referencing Indian judiciary as an example of independence in the region. Uh, but lately, the Indian judiciary has been acting uh, more like a handmaiden of the government, especially with the Ram Jarma Bhumi decision and then and the recent decision with uh, regards to uh, Adwani and others who were accused of vandalism, uh, of destroying the Babri Masjid. So given the declining independence uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, credibility of the Indian judiciary system. 
do you think that Amnesty International has any legal recourse that it can take and challenge the government's decision and also try to get the courts to move against uh, these uh, harassment tactics that the government is employing? Oh, that's a very difficult question to answer. I do think that uh, we, we, we believe that our case would be, will be quite strong um, in, any, uh, in any court of law. The, um, the, the, tri the tricky thing with the judiciary is that there is, um, there is a sense that there is a uh, lessening of independence. Um, and, and, and on top of that, I would just note, uh, I mean, what you said, I think is, is, I can't disagree with any of it. It's just one of the other issues is that um, the, even before this sense in the judiciary, the, the nature of ju the judiciary changing, we had, um, severe backlogs of under trials in, in the country where people were languishing in prison for years before, uh, before then being acquitted 20 years later and things like that. And so, so there is this uh, concern that was ongoing in terms of ju judiciary on top of this uh, growing sense of, uh, of a lack or a change in terms of the independence of the judiciary. The, um, and then on top of this, with the pandemic, you have uh, further delays that are occurring with um, with the court system. So there is, um, yeah, I mean, there is a there is a growing level of concern. I, I I've seen it um, expressed just in the past couple of days, as you as you um, as you note that the um, uh, Babir Masjid uh, acquittals just came down a couple of days ago, and there a couple of days ago or yesterday, and um, there is a uh, a lot of um, outrage expressed over over what seemed to be on on its face fairly obvious evidence from video of people involved in the destruction. Yet there are all of these acquittals, and so there is this concern. Uh, you know, uh, I I really admire and respect the work that uh, people like you are doing, and, and in some places, uh, uh, standing up for human rights is also a dangerous uh, uh, activity. Uh, so my question to you now is, what do people like us, who are part of the Indian diaspora, uh, what can we do to to stem? I mean, this is to arrest this negative development of India's civil society and democracy. It seems to be going uh, literally down the hole uh, and with increasing speed. Uh, so uh, before India becomes like an authoritarian fascist state, uh, what can we do to, to preserve these institutions which have developed slowly but steadily? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of judiciary, uh, the right to dissent, uh, and also the, the fundamental rights as they're enshrined in the Indian constitution. What can Indians like us who live abroad uh, do? I think that, uh, so Indian, Indian Americans have, have such an important role to play. The, the government of India cares very deeply about what, the, what Americans think of India. It is, it, it's, um, it's quite, uh, they may say they don't, but but fundamentally they they do very much, and and you can tell when when there is a reaction that you you can see that you can see the um, the reaction you get from the government of India on it, and, and and what Indian Americans and and others in the diaspora can do is use their their power as being either citizens or residents in their country to lobby their own country, the US government, the Canadian government, the German government, to impress upon the government of India to respect and protect human rights violate, uh, and, and to uh, prosecute human rights violations and to, um, to ensure that um, 
that that India uh, upholds its commitments to inter international law. And so there there is um, there's much that Indian Americans as as a group can do to to lobby their own government. They can at a minimum talk to their own member of Congress. If they live in a any any uh, member of Congress, regardless of political party, if they live in a particular uh, constituency, can can call their member of Congress, and they will respond because they're a member, they're in their constituency, they're in their district, and so that's at a minimum something that they can do. They can join um, groups such as. Uh, um, Hindus for Human Rights or Indian American Muslim Council or other other groups that are within the United States that are uh, working to further human rights in India. Um, they could also talk to their family members uh, and to um, tell their family members to uh, support human rights in in India. It is um, it's really. Uh, the power that we have as Indian Americans to uh, to further human rights in India should not be underestimated, and I think we have not, as 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 Indian Americans, we haven't really used our influence as much as we we could. I think that there are individuals who have, but it's only in in recent years that I really see this flourishing of of activism that is, that has been occurring within the Indian American community. And I think it's only going to strengthen over the years. So I, I am very optimistic about the prospects of, of people in the diaspora mobilizing together to really uh, further human rights um, in India. In India, I think that's the one really optimistic thing that I see uh, for us um, in the coming years. You know, we do see that the Indian government is doing significant outreach to Indian Americans. The Howdy Modi event uh, in Houston a few months ago is indicative of that. And it, it does appear that the governments overseas, and not just India, but other countries too, are trying to sort of weaponize the diaspora uh, and convert the entire diaspora into like a foreign agent that advances the interest uh, of those governments and those nations. Do you think that there is a need for civil society institutions in the U.S. to educate Indian Americans about the importance of civil rights, human rights, and democracy, protecting dissent, protecting rule of law, independent judiciary, these important pillars uh, of democracy? Do you think that Indian Americans lack the education to appreciate this so that they can act as agents who preserve democracy? I think there's some of that. I think there's a um, there's probably some nostalgia. There's a, I think there's a combination of nostalgia or maybe not wanting to know, but there's also I think uh, perhaps some pride about their the country back home, as it were, quote unquote. Um, but there's also some education that may be needed. But uh, but what? Uh, but I also see that there's there's quite a bit of mobilization that has been occurring so i think i think you're right that that there has been uh perhaps that uh, a need to educate but i do think that there's also this mobilization that's occurring that is wanting to see this mobilization around um uh, respect for human rights and and seeking social justice back in India, and um, I, I I think it's growing and very impressive. It's uh, um, it, it could be related to uh, the reaction to Howdy Modi, but it could also be just a a natural reaction to um, to seeing seeing the growing uh, intolerance in India or um, or uh, disrespect for human rights that's occurring in India. And so that may be causing that reaction uh, as well. But, but I do think that it's, it's, um, it is an interesting, I mean, just from knowing, of course, being an Indian American myself, knowing uh, people who from, say, an, who, who may have a more nostalgic view of India, that that, that nostalgia may not be uh that may be a more 
difficult thing to get through than say uh, someone who doesn't quite understand what's going on in India. And so there's all there's these different currents of uh, within the diaspora. But but I this is where I am very optimistic and hopeful and um, excited about seeing all of the all of the um, action within within the diaspora about human rights in India. It actually is 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 very uh, hopeful to me. Maybe well, naively, but I hope not. <laughs> well, I think that that optimistic nod is uh, a good point uh, to to let you go. Thank you very much for talking to me, taking your time out uh, in your busy day. And uh, as I said earlier, that I really appreciate, and I'm sure a lot of Indian Americans and Indians also appreciate the work you personally do and the work that Amnesty International has been doing. And I, and I am sure that even though uh, Amnesty International may not be operating in India, I'm sure they will still continue to worry about human rights in India. So oh, thank yeah. you very much, Govind Acharya. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.